Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining uh, what will be a, a really interesting evening at New South Wales Farmers' first 30 by 30 webinar. My name is Pete Arkell and I'm CEO of New South Wales Farmers. And uh, thanks again for joining us for uh, this evening's session. This will be the first in a series of webinars that will consider New South Wales' agricultural industry and our quest to realise $30 billion of farm gate income by 2030 and contribute towards our national industry goal of $100 billion by 2030 as champion by the NFF. I'd like to commence tonight's proceedings by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional owners of this land, and pay my respects to elders both past and present. I'd like to recognise their continuing connection to land, to water, to agriculture, and to the wider Australian community. Agriculture and regional New South Wales are at a critical moment. As our state looks to rebuild from the economic impacts of COVID-19, agriculture will be a key industry in driving this recovery. Agriculture is one of New South Wales's few engine industries, an industry that actually generates wealth from beyond our borders and brings that income into our state. Realising about $6 billion in export income for New South Wales each and every year, about 10% of our state's exports. Our farming businesses and supply chains generate economic activity, both domestically and internationally, that will be absolutely critical in helping New South Wales to stimulate a recovery from this COVID recession. The ability of farming to contribute to our state economy exists now, but there's much more potential for our industry to grow substantially and to add even more value. We're currently sitting a decade out from 2030. And as I've mentioned, our industry has a goal of realising $30 billion by 2030. So we're now at a critical moment in terms of planning around how we can realise this ambitious goal in the decade ahead. Tonight, we'll be really fortunate to hear from a number of key ministers with critical portfolios that will shape the future of farming in New South Wales. Tonight, I'd like to welcome the Honourable Adam Marshall, Minister for Agriculture in Western New South Wales. I'd like to welcome the Honourable Melinda Pavey, the Minister for Water, Property and Housing. And the Acting Deputy Premier, the Honourable Paul Toole, who's also Minister for Regional Transport and Roads, will be joining us at about quarter past six. We'll have the opportunity to hear, hear each of these ministers' visions for the industry, specifically relating to, to their portfolios, to hear about potential opportunities, and also the barriers we see to growth in agriculture over the coming decade. Ultimately, we want to foster a discussion around how agriculture can build productivity both in the short term to help drive that COVID recovery I've talked about, but also over the longer term as our industry gears up to more than double its contribution in the decade ahead. We'll be asking for each of the ministers to, uh, to share some, some introductory remarks, and then we'll be um, moving to a series of questions, uh, a number of questions we've received from people who've joined us on the web webinar tonight, and we'll also be taking some, some live, uh, live questions through the chat functions on the webinar. So please, uh, please think about your questions as you uh, you hear from each of, each of the ministers here tonight. So thanks to everyone once again for joining and uh, now I'd like to hand over to Minister Pavey to provide her uh, opening remarks. Minister. Uh, good evening everybody. Thank you Peter um, and uh, to my colleagues if they're on or off the line. Um, Pleasure to be here tonight, um, and I do, I share in your vision too um, of a trebling of our, of our agricultural output uh, by, by, by 2030. Um, and I think the last couple of weeks have given you an indication of how hard that is to push for that. And I'm just going to preface my comments by, by remarking, I am a great supporter um, of the timber industry. It is central to my electorate of Oxley on the state's mid-north coast. 
and the fact that we are a net importer of timber is a national disgrace and that 80% of our hardwood, when we grow the best hardwood in the world, actually uh, is, is, uh, is, is something we should be embarrassed about when we do have the strongest environmental regulations uh, in terms of harvesting in the world. I, I want to say that and I also want to say I love koalas and I want their population to double. Um, and I know that everybody on, on this call tonight would also um, strive for that. And I think a true and accurate count um, of, our, our, of our koala population would actually show that uh, we are in a stronger position than, uh, than some would have us believe. But I'm here to talk about water tonight and I'm proud of what I've achieved in the past 18 months with your support. Um, going into an election with a commitment to Wyangla Dam, uh, raising that by 650 gigalitres. Also working with the Commonwealth, a, a really golden time for us to be doing the right thing. Uh, working with our federal counterparts, and now we've got a commitment to Dungowan Dam and Mole River on, on, the, on the border area. Um, that is exciting. Our regional water strategies will work over the top of that to ensure that we have the water and we have some knowledge about uh, what you know, the long-term uh, forecasts are based off a lot of historical data that we've been going through with the University of Adelaide and the University of Newcastle so that we get a clearer picture of what the future may look like, acknowledging climate change, the, climate, the, the planet has changed and it will continue to change um, so that we are prepared with, uh, with higher rainfall in maybe leaner times uh, so that we can survive through drought. So we can work to that goal of $30 billion in agricultural output um, in, 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 a, in a very short space of time. Uh, absolutely support that. And also as a, as, an, as a coastal MP, very aware for too long, um, many of us on the coast and our capacity has been limited by a 1999 policy in relation to harvestable rights. It was meant to be reviewed a couple of years later um, I was one of those pesky backbenchers when I became elected in 2015 and pushed for that review. Um, I know it's taken me a while. I've been in the portfolio now 18 months. But, you know, you talk about barriers. There are a lot of internal barriers to proper conversations based on science and evidence around what is right uh, for our communities and the environment. I do also notice uh, that Robbie Sefton, I hope he's on the call. I thank her for her work with the Murray-Darling Basin and her social and economic report, and we are working on many of the same themes. Robbie, this is about listening and respecting communities. It is about saying, let's make our rivers healthier. Let's make sure that they're not full of carp at the level of 90%, which is what they are mostly. That is not a good environmental outcome. Um, but we also know that, uh, that we have done good work on the SDLs, but figures that we were forced upon us in 2012 by Tony Burke and Penny Wong aren't necessarily what's right for our communities. Acknowledge what we've done, work towards some better outcomes by listening to our communities around Menindi and around Yanko. Um, that's what we absolutely need to do. And I'm absolutely heartened by the approach that Keith Pitt is taking. Um, I'm also pushing for a change in legislation because we can't meet the timetable of arrangements put down in, uh, in the legislation for 2024. And I'm pushing for some honest conversations around that and it's coincidentally supported by my uh, Labor colleague uh, in the Victorian Parliament, the Minister for Water down there, Lisa Neville. Also making some changes in relation to meetings and recording action items, making sure that all stakeholders are signing off on what happens at a meeting. I've heard too many stories from too many good people that their ideas um, and thoughts were not recorded in a proper and decent way. Um, and you know that that has resulted in some some lack of lack of faith um, from the productive sector, and I, I intend to restore that. Um, and in the next few months, you'll also hear about some um, some important changes that will put more people on the ground, so that we have policy decisions being driven by people that understand and know our regions, not to, not dictated to by by people that you know that. Is true. Live in the, in 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 the the city precinct. So, also working on um, raising the Barandong uh, Dam to a full supply level, getting our, the paintbrush out, and some advice I've had initially on that in terms of the cost of doing that assessment are quite strangling. Um, but yes, we are committed to infrastructure. We are committed to have to improving harvestable rights on the coast. 
We are committed to working collaboratively with the Commonwealth and the good work and the initiative that Minister Pete has shown um, and uh, continuing to, to listen and respect uh, those that, uh, that, uh, that, that keep our community is going strong. So I think I'm at 10 minutes now, or no, about five minutes, but I really would like to take your questions to get the most out of them tonight. Thank you, Minister. So I've got a few questions that have come in uh, through the registration process. So I might lead off and then um, Dan will let me know if we're, we're having any through on the chat room. But um, look, look, over the, the last couple of years, I guess the the question of water security has really come into to stark focus with, um, I guess, a number of sort of critical regional industries potentially facing no water scenarios. Um, the question that's come through is, um, as regional communities expand and water resources need to be shared, how is the New South Wales government planning to make sure there's enough to go around? Well, two of the biggest communities we, 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 we suffered through the drought um, was of course Dubbo and uh, and Tamworth in the Peel Valley. In the Peel Valley, you have a, um, a council quite rightly that want to grow the town to 100,000. You've got a lot of industry. You've got a lot of um, productive sector, a lot of farmers, a lot of irrigators. Um, but you know that is why we're putting in uh, a new Dungowan Dam. Not huge compared to to Wyangla in its size, but it will give, importantly, water security for the town, and that, that has to be first and foremost, which it will be through our regional strategies. But also, Barrenzong, you know, to get down to 5% in that dam, um, you know, we need to ensure that uh, that we can, re, re, you know, improve that capacity by about 100 gigs. But let's not also forget that this drought was so sinister. Uh, we nearly ran out of water in towns like Taree and Foster, even Port Macquarie, Bellingen, Kempsey. I mean, we had a major crisis afoot. And, you know, things have changed. We've had the, the dipolar change to La Nina. That is exciting. But we also have to acknowledge that we have enormous East Coast lows. You know, in February, we were down to 41% at Warragamba Dam and the Sydney catchment. If, um, if that had continued, we'd, we would be down to 30% today. Uh, and we can't drink. We've never drunk Sydney's water below 30%. So, you know, there are big challenges, which is why we need to increase our supply um, capacity, which is why we are doing what we're doing and supporting great towns like Orange and Bathurst by doing stormwater harvesting straight to potable. Orange, the first in Australia in, to do it. This is the type of technology we need to, to address. Um, but our Western Weirs program is also designed to improve connectivity down the Darling, improve, um, you know, the habitat for our native fish species. You know, this is the big infrastructure. So we've got $800 million for town, for councils, for town water supplies, and we've also got billions in our new dams, Mole River, Dungowan, and Wyangla, um, and we'll continue to listen and advocate for more funding to give that security, uh, because that's what our productive sector needs. But don't be, don't, don't forget how hard this is. We've also, we've already got the shooters supporting an upper house inquiry um, in the New South Wales Legislative Council. With the Greens, the Greens are running it, the shooters voted for it, and it will all be about trying to undermine our case and the community's confidence in what we are doing. So if people are having any issues with their um connections, please try refreshing your browser there. It um, does seem to be dropping in and out a little bit at my end, but we'll, we'll continue on. Um, Minister, thanks for uh, for your comments around um, an honest appraisal of where we're at with the Basin Plan, and I, I note your, your comments to the uh, the Senate inquiry only, only last week. Um, I mean, how do you see that moving forward, and, and do, you, do you see the possibility of some flexibility in the, the 2024 deadlines and the chance to, to look at alternate SDL options where they might be available? I do. I'm very excited. And I, I think Robbie Sefton um, and her report has helped lay that groundwork. My relationship with Keith Pitt is excellent. He's a real common sense sort of bloke. Um, and that is helpful. He's not into playing games. He wants an outcome. And my argument to him and his to me is we've got $2.7 billion sitting there 
uh, within the Commonwealth to spend on infrastructure to improve the environment. Let's get that money out the door. I mean, let's be let's also be very clear. New South Wales has done a brilliant job on, on uh, we've got 22 of the SDL projects. We've done uh, 13. We've got nine to do, and we've only got a problem with about five of them, which is Yanko and, and Menindi, the, two of the major issues. We can work through that. They're just not going to get the savings that they, do, you know, that they thought that they could get or tell us what they wanted in 2012. I mean, I've had the stakeholder groups just walk away out of lack of respect, and I don't blame them. There's been three or four lots of engagement, one by the MDBA, which was a disaster. Then they put our guys in. They water New South Wales. And, and, and we're completely off the plot as far as the community is concerned. We need to fix that and look at other solutions that the farmers are telling us about, which also gives us a lot of um, advantages uh, in terms of complementary measures. I think we can do this. And I, I know I'm off to South Australia. I'm not going to do a, you know, it's just going to be a quiet visit. I'm going to catch up with um, with Rex Patrick and those that listen to that um, that Senate inquiry. You know, it was a really fruitful conversation between us all, the South Australians and myself. It was done with respect. I've got to say, until uh, Sarah Hanson Young came on and she had the television lines, which didn't get up. But we can do this. It's got to be farmer and farmer. So I think the NFF have a part to play here. Um, because those Riverland farmers are also facing pressures and stresses. And there's a lot of work we can do in South Australia with some of that 2.7 billion that will, you know, ensure more connectivity and more water. Um, we need to do it and we must do it. I would certainly agree with those statements. So there's a, a basin-related question here from uh, Chris Stillard from Baruga. And, um, it relates to whether the New South Wales government will promote horticulture above the Barmer choke, um, taking into account the constraints to downstream demand uh, and delivery uh, delivery constraints. I mean, one of the worst things a government can do is tell people what to grow. Um, you know, it didn't work really well in the USSR and China. Um, but we do have a physical problem with the Barmer choke. They had to put some fill in there the other day to stop it collapsing. So. I have agreed at Minco uh, with Lisa Neville's suggestion um, not, you know, to actually really review more horticulture, more almonds, for example, going in um, to, to the to the what would you say to the west of the choke. Um, and but you know that's also you know it's a little bit sanctimonious of them now. Of the new almond crops, 75% have gone into South Australia, into Victoria about 10% in South Australia, and we've got about 5%. So I think there's going to be a market correction. I mean, that's my, you know, who am I to make an economic prediction about almonds? But some of the experts are telling me that, and even the almond border, you know, the almond, you know, uh, representative group is saying, don't put any more in. I think there's going to be some problems. But we do have to deal with the trade below the choke, um, the, the pressure it's putting on the farmer choke, but also the loss of water through the conveyancing is a real problem. Um, no one's given me a, you know, a solution wrapped up in a box with a bow on it. Um, but it is something that we're all very aware of and very concerned about. Thanks, Minister. Uh, the next question relates to floodplain harvesting, which has also been in the news, and I guess um, the licensing of floodplain harvesting in New South Wales, I guess, is the final piece in the reform puzzle for, for New South Wales' uh, as water framework. I, I guess the, the question that's been asked, Minister, is um, are you confident we have the necessary resources uh, to ensure that those critical reforms can be implemented on time by, by 1 July next year? Yes, but I'm not confident when I see an unholy alliance of a Greens elected independent upper house member supported by Greens, Labor, shooters, all voting to disallow our regulation. It was the most disgraceful abuse of upper house process. The upper house is meant to be the house of review, not the house of no. What that regulation did was give us a pathway to licensing. Um, yes, another issue that probably should have been resolved decades ago. Uh, but it was a process about also enabled us to put the embargo on during the February rains to ensure that we got the flow and we got 550 gigalitres into Menindee. And, you know, 
depending on what part of the basin is, whether you supported that approach or not. But the worst thing that's going on at the moment is, is the pitting of southern farmers against northern farmers for us to succeed in terms of adapting the Murray-Darling Basin Plan so it better reflects the needs of New South Wales and therefore the nation, given our importance to national economic growth and prosperity, and there's going to be nothing like it during, you know, as we come out of COVID, to have um, this political opportunism that's going on is distressing and disappointing. So we're working through the implications of that disallowance of that motion last week. Um, but to the most important part of your question, we are on track for July 1, 2021, a licensing regime for floodplain harvesting, which gives everybody certainty. It will show the people of Broken Hill and the Lower Darling and the Southern Irrigators that, you know, it, that you know, it's not uh, it's not a it's not a take that is unsustainable and is unfair. It will hopefully you know get rid of some of these divisions that exist, along with um, our NRA water police out there on the beat, 160 of them helping everybody along with compliance. We're doing the right things, um, and you know I'm proud of what we're achieving uh, on behalf of of farmers in the productive sector in New South Wales. Um, but you know we've still got some 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 steps to climb. Uh, but the most important part of that question is we will, and this is what I, I keep challenging my officials, um, that we will be ready by July uh, July 1, 2021. Now that's really encouraging to hear, Minister. It is a critical piece of work that New South Wales farmers um, firmly firmly supports. So uh, let's get that done. I might just check in to see if Acting Deputy Premier Tools joined us at this stage. Are you, are you online, Deputy Premier? Yeah, I'm here, Pete. Good evening. Good evening, Paul. Thanks, thanks for joining us. Mel, I'd be remiss of you being uh, from a coastal electorate and you did mention harvestable rights. Um, how do you see things moving forward for, for that critical eastern fall uh, that relies, uh, that is such productive agricultural country? Well, I can understand why it hasn't happened before, because the department's trying to make it as hard as possible, and we keep pushing back. So we're going to have a, a document, and I, I have said this um, to James, your president, before. When we release it, we need you to, to get some independent assessments of it and support it wholeheartedly, because there's a whole industry of people that don't want this to go forward. Um, and we've really pushed some of the science and the modelling that they've given us uh, and that is why this has taken longer than what I wanted it to, but it's going to be a document um, that is going to be strong and focused on a valley-by-valley -valley rainfall. Uh, we forced um, the agency to provide us with that sort of data. It's been wanting, to be honest. Um, I'm really excited about it, um, and if, if we're going to try and, and meet those goals of that uh, increase in, in, in production in agriculture, we're going to need the coast to start lifting uh, in a way that it has been curtailed because of its access. You know, we we know Dorigo has got the most incredible rainfall and we, you know, Comboyne and, and all of those areas. But this drought also showed we nearly ran out of water. So we can take stresses off, um, off our major rivers uh, by allowing farmers to capture more on their properties and give us an opportunity to grow um, agricultural production, which uh, which which benefits the nation. Oh, well, thank you for your remarks tonight, Minister Pavey. I think uh, getting the water piece is, is absolutely critical to reala realising our goal of, of 30 by 30. So um, it's it's really encouraging to hear how reforms are, are progressing across those, those critical topics we've discussed. So uh, thanks, thanks very much for joining us. My pleasure. I might now throw to the... Thanks, Minister. I might now throw to the Acting Deputy, Deputy Premier, who's um, obviously got a bit of a broader job description in the last, uh, last couple of weeks. So, uh, look, Paul, thanks for joining us tonight. I yeah, wel welcome any opening remarks from, from you before we take a few questions uh, from, from our... Uh, our listeners this evening. Yeah, that's fine, Pete. And uh, yeah, look, thanks for the opportunity to come on tonight and actually, you know, talk about a few things. So what I thought I might do is, Pete, at the start, I just might give you a bit of a snapshot around the state as to some of the 
the investment and some of the projects that are taking place at the moment, just to you know have a bit of an understanding as to what's actually happening. And you know, for me, you know, in my role, yeah, look, I'm acting uh, deputy premier at the moment, so I've got that role for the uh, for the four week period. But you know, uh, primarily, uh, my role is actually the minister for regional transport and roads and Look, it's probably the first time that we've ever seen someone that's actually been dedicated to the role. And my main focus is just to be looking at integrated transport in the regions. And, you know, that's exciting. That's important for our communities. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, one of the challenges and one of the things that I want to do is to make sure that we can supercharge that investment, uh, keep it rolling out into the regions, because at, at the end of the day, you know, when we have a look at what we've been confronted with, you know, with bushfires and, and drought and a pandemic, there's no doubt that that's changed everybody's lives and it's changed the way in which we do things. But one thing that's important through all of this is the fact that, you know, it hasn't changed our commitment to ensure that we keep that infrastructure rolling out across regional New South Wales. And that's important because that's actually going to create opportunities for people in regional New South Wales. It's going to unlock opportunities for our, for our freight operators. And at the end of the day, it's about bringing businesses closer uh, to the customer. So, you know, for that, um, it is critical. And look, I just say this year alone, we're actually investing around $6 billion just in roads and transport. Uh, and even like last week, I had the opportunity with the Premier and the, and the Treasurer, and we were able to actually also announce an additional $1.8 billion and that's going into infrastructure projects that are shovel ready in our local communities. And I can tell you right now that, you know, we can talk about job keeper and job seeker, but when they come offline, it is going to be critical that people have employment and that we continue to ensure that our contractors and our subcontractors have the work that is needed because they're going to be also critical in driving economic activity uh, in our local communities as well. And Look, the infrastructure what we're talking about is probably infrastructure that's going to also serve the bush for, for generations to come. And, and I think that's what's exciting about having this particular role. Just quickly, Pete, in, look, in the far west of the state, you know, we're, we're probably sealing at the moment 180 kilometres of the Silver City and Cobb highways. And look, that's actually on track to be completed by 2022. So it's actually six months ahead of schedule. And you know, only a few months ago, I went out to the Silver City Highway. Um, I officially opened it. And I can tell you now, just the excitement from the community up there where they were saying, we never thought this would happen. And, you know, this is actually people thinking that it's, you know, tar. Are they thinking that it's just bitumen? Well, it's actually more than that. Because anybody knows that when we're rebuilding these roads, we're actually keeping access open uh, during times of, of flood and weather events. And, Instead of being closed for weeks on end and we can't get the locals through, we can't get freight through, uh, we're actually opening the road within a couple of days. So that's just already making a, a big difference there. Uh, the Newell Highway for, you know, a lot, a lot of, a lot of our, um, you know, a lot of freight that moves up and down the, the Newell Highway. There's no doubt that the the Newell Highway is the freight backbone of the state, and we've already got. You know, $500 million going into that, making it safer, improving travel times. We've actually got a very different model there. We've been using an alliance model, and that's actually probably seeing, you know, 15 overtaking lanes at the moment either being completed or are underway. And we're actually going to, you know, we're actually committed to creating 30 lanes, but the way in which we're going, we could actually roll out more. And instead of actually being done in eight years, we're actually going to have it completed in four. So that's going to make a, a huge difference there uh, in that particular uh, area. Uh, the Pacific Highway, I'll just touch on it quickly. The Pacific Highway, it's probably one of those projects that, you know, is probably the biggest road infrastructure project in regional Australia. Now, this is a $15 billion project. It's been, you know, in the making for, for 20 years, but it's also created something like around 1,900 jobs just on site. So, you know, it's transformed the way in which people, you know, move up and down the North Coast. It makes it faster, makes it safer, makes it more reliable. And even with, even with um, you know, accidents that we've seen, they've already been halved uh, with the amount of work that's already happened in the Pacific Highway. So 
The next phase will be obviously finishing off the Walgulga to Ballina section, but after that we're going to uh, move into the uh, Coffs Harbour bypass. And you know, for Coffs Harbour, that's a that's a 1.8 billion dollar project. And, and again, you know, we're going to see a, a 14 kilometre bypass of, of Coffs Harbour. It's going to create something like 12,000 direct and indirect jobs. And you now we've actually you know fast tracked the planning approvals. Uh, and now we want to actually, you know, have the the best model of contracts at the end of the year, so we actually start to see it underway. So, you know, that's 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 happening. The Princess Highway, look, we've got you know commitment down there. Um, you know, from work from from south of Nara, it's actually a 1.5 billion dollar investment. Uh, we're looking at bypasses around Milton Nulladulla, Mariah, and um, and the Jarvis Bay Road intersection. Uh, so we'll continue working on them. We've had workshops and uh, again with the Jarvis Bay intersection, we'll actually come out with our preferred option, um, you know, at the end of the year and actually then, you know, get on with it. For a lot of people that may be online, I mean, one for me quite personally, but also one that I have a lot of interest in is the uh, Great Western Highway. Uh, as you'd be aware, the, the New South Wales government before the last election actually uh, put on the table $2.5 billion to upgrade the Great Western Highway between Katoomba and Lithgow. So that's about a 35-kilometre a section of road. And look, you know, crossing the mountains has never been easy, um, but I think it also shows that the government's not afraid to think big. And we know this is a, a very complex project. It's very challenging. You know, there's a steep terrain. We've got the railway line next to it as well. We've got the natural environment, we've got, you know, heritage issues to deal with. But at the end of the day, um, you know, we're committed to actually improving that road. We're committed to actually making it uh, dual, dual lane all the way through to Lithgow from uh, Katoomba. And certainly uh, we've been doing a lot of work with the uh, community of Blackheath around what is going to be the, uh, the best model for that particular area as well. Um, just, just in relation to uh, some other projects that we're doing, we've got, um, you know, we've, we've got the, the Musselbrook and, and Singleton uh, bypasses that we're looking at as well. Um, we've got our Fixing Country Bridges program. So um, there's been a bit of media around the Fixing Country Bridges program. And what I've done there as the minister as well is a lot of the money was back-ended. So it wasn't going to come in until the later years. So what I've been able to do is to work with the tre work with Treasury work with the government and we've been able to flip it around so now we can start to see some of that money coming in a lot earlier so we know that timber bridges you know can impact on connectivity in the bush we know that local councils actually look after more than 1800 timber bridges across the state some of them are close to 100 years old and and really you know they impact on on productivity they impact on local communities so by partnering with councils and having this $500 million, we're going to be able to fix some of these bridges that have been hampering and, and holding back some of our, our communities. So uh, that's, a, that's a really important one. Um, uh, fixing local roads, we've got another program, uh, which is another $500 million. And it was only a few months ago that Michael McCormack and I actually announced the first round of it where, I was, where the state government's putting in $500 million, but we've also got the, the Commonwealth to come along and almost put in $200 million. So it's actually nearly a, a $700 million program. And in the first round, we actually announced $250 million to be delivered. But what it gives us is 258 projects on the ground right now. And that means that those roads that are important to those local communities uh, have been identified as to receiving funding. And that funding is actually, again, going to create jobs in the local community, but it just means it's going to be safer. And, you know, whether it be, you know, uh, you know, people using these roads every day, whether it's mums and dads, you know, just going in and out of town for shopping or, you know, or just go, or going and catch up with family and friends or even a school bus on it, it's just going to make a, a huge difference to uh, those local communities. So that's the first of a number of rounds um, that we're going to roll out. But that's probably a billion dollar commitment that we gave um, before the last election. And, and what we want to do there is to uh, certainly make sure that the, the funding is out, is out the door as quickly as possible, uh, which is actually what it's going to do. And again, I reiterate that 
Councils put forth their priorities, um, they're assessed, but at the end of the day, they have to be ready to go. They can't be projects that councils are putting forward and you know, they want to sit on the money for you know, several years. I've got to be honest, that, that does upset me um, when I see councils getting money and they don't actually get it out the door. This is about stimulus money. This is about making sure that jobs are created very quickly. And that's why I want to make sure that we continue to you know, turbocharge the regions with this funding as well. Uh, in relation to uh, fixing country rail, we've got a, we've got a program as fixing country rail. And again, there's a, around about $400 million that's uh, invested into, into this particular program. So what we've actually seen is you know, loop, uh, rail loops that are being created uh, we've also got um, a number of studies at the moment that have actually uh, been completed as well and look for people that may be interested in, um, there's one line down towards Blaney to Demondral. Um, we actually released the study on that the other day but it actually didn't stack up as being a viable project today but what it actually um, showed us is the fact that uh, if there is going to be more freight into the future put onto that particular line uh, it actually could potentially stack up. So rather than actually sit back and then wait for another five years before we do the work, what I'm actually going to do is actually get the, the high level work, the engineering work done now um, so that when it is actually uh, ready and we see that the main western line being constrained by uh, the number of vehicles on it, or number of vehicles and the number of uh, our trains on it, uh, we'll certainly be, uh, there'll certainly be a need for that line to uh, be reopened um, just in relation to, I'll just probably just do a bit of a, a, sh a shout out to everybody. Just, just remember at the moment, one of the sad things that I get to see as the Minister for Roads and Transport is the fact that I still, um, you know, you'd actually think with COVID there'd be, um, you know, less accidents occurring on the roads. And I've got to be honest, um, you know, at the moment we're still seeing, you know, fatalities and uh, and serious injuries quite high across the state and they are a little bit down in the country at the moment but it's probably just a reminder to everybody that when we're traveling on our roads when we're doing you know late nights and all of that you know when we're working uh, our farms uh, to make sure that you, you look after yourself and you keep yourself safe at the end of the day because um, yeah, at the end of the day we you know we sort of get in the bush we've got about two-thirds of fatalities that actually occur in the bush and you know we've only got a third of the population so you know we are finding that it, it is disproportionate um, and I've got to say we can't use the, the the language where we say that it's it's people from Sydney they come out to the bush they don't know our roads well the stats actually show that it's more likely to be a local um, and I think that's quite confronting as well when you start to see some of that information being provided so again um, you know, if you can, you know, get your family members, your friends, I mean, as an organisation, can I just get you to really fire up about, you know, road safety and putting the message out there so that, you know, people are, you know, doing the right thing. And, and the sad thing is, uh, studies actually show that people think speeding's acceptable. And just because we drive a road over 100 times, people think they can actually creep up and, and go a little bit faster as well, and it'll be okay. But we just got to remember that. We're probably, um, again, we're probably investing strongly in roads when it comes to uh, safety upgrades. We've got, you know, uh, wire barriers going in. We've, we've got sealing of roads taking place. We're upgrading intersections and, and even those rumble strips on a number of our roads uh, are also occurring as well. So plenty happening. And, um, you know, obviously uh, from, from your, from the New South Wales farmers, to actually see these things happening is actually critical. Uh, in the bush as well, so it's about making sure we have that connectivity. It's about unlocking opportunities, and and again, it's about providing that that boost to the economy and creating jobs. So, well, there's a snapshot, Pete. I know it's a bit long-winded, so apologies. No, oh, thanks, Minister. Covered a lot of ground there, so uh, a lot of interesting questions coming out of that. I mean. Um, we are heading into hopefully what looks like a really promising grain harvest, probably the, uh, a crop in the order of the, the huge crop we saw in 2016. So I, I think there's um, a lot of focus on our, our grain logistics across New South Wales. I'd, I'd just be interested in your comments. I think um, that the cost path for New South Wales grain producers in the northwest is about two and a half times that the 
logistics costs that their Canadian counterparts might might face getting their grain to to port. I'm just wondering your thoughts on whether we can expect some improvements in in terms of logistical cost reductions over the next decade, and and maybe how do you see inland rail playing into that for for broad acre commodities? Yeah, look, I think um, look, let me put it this way. I mean, today I probably spent a lot of time on the uh, the telephone. I actually have a, a freight uh, advisory council, and and we obviously look at the supply chain and. Obviously, there was a lot of discussion about also uh, the movement of, of freight and grain in the state. I mean, obviously, and I don't want to go into it in too much detail, but there's been a lot of talk around the ports at the moment and being able to move containers. And we've actually got, you know, farmers that are actually probably really worried about that because we could potentially be seeing some of our farmers that could be getting some of the best crops that they've seen since 2016. And you know, to have issues around the ports could actually create real problems. So uh, we've been doing what we can. I mean, it's more of a, a Commonwealth matter, but we've been trying to pull the levers that we can to uh, address that situation. But, you know, it's about trying to make sure that, you know, that the, the movement of freight is going to be critical there uh, in that from that point. Um, you are right. I mean, I think, you know, inland rail is going to have uh, opportunities into the future when it comes to, uh, moving of, of, of freight right across this country. I mean, obviously, it, it is a it's about a twelve billion dollar project that the uh, the feds are actually uh, putting into. So I think you know, but I think it's about the the branches off that as well. So I think there has to be you know great opportunity for you know those that aren't necessarily tied directly to the line to actually have access to different points and different pinch points to be able to make access of inland rail to ensure that those costs are going to be uh, lowered because obviously that's a good thing when we see that investment going back into our communities too. Thanks for that. We've got a um, a question from the far west of the state. It's always great to uh, see some Western Division members joining for the teleconference and the webinar tonight. So from Justin and uh, Julie McC McClure from Tilpa. Um, is there a plan to upgrade roads in the remote areas that seem to have missed out to date? Yeah, look, I mean, I think there is absolutely a commitment and I, and I actually go, when you have a look at our programs like fixing country roads, I can tell you right now that, you know, areas in the far west of the state, I mean, you know, around some of those smaller communities around Brawarana and Walgett, the amount of the amount of money that we are actually investing into those councils is at a record high. So when we actually see that money going into those communities, you know, it's also about the councils having the capacity to be able to spend it. So you now for some councils, they are going to be the body that's actually going to be doing the work. So I can tell you right now that you know we are spending millions, tens of millions of dollars. Uh, into road projects in the far west of the state, and you know, I can I can say right now, whether it's the the Cedar Barwon, whether it's the Cedar Murray, uh, there is many projects that are actually receiving adequate funding. Well, not adequate. I can tell you right now, they are receiving lots of funding from the state government into road improvements, and that could be our fixing local roads, our fixing country roads uh, programs. Uh, and I tell you now, some of those councils have not seen the dollars that they are getting today ever in their lifetime. And I can tell you that uh, genuinely as being a former councillor myself, that the investment and the dollars that we're seeing going out into the regions has never been like what it has. So, you know, those uh, communities in the far west, uh, you're, not, you're certainly not missing out because that's actually critical as well. We've also got, um, you know, without fixing country roads, it's also about making sure that that particular program's been looking at where, where freight movements are, uh, so where applications have come in, where freight moves across the state in the far west. Uh, we've also got you know, areas where it's the, the last mile. So you might have a road that's sealed, but it might be that, you know, that last mile that needs to be completed. So those roads are absolutely critical uh, when it comes to you know, being improved to allow productivity within those local areas to occur. So yeah, absolutely committed to uh, continuing that investment. And, and the far west is certainly critical to the state. And as the minister, as I go back to the very start, the Minister for Regional Transport and Roads, I don't care about, well, I won't tell that. I'll say that 
my, my focus is on the regions and the roads that are in the regions and where they're going to create um, the best opportunity for productivity and making them safe. Paul, the question just come through, um, yeah, probably in your uh, your current acting role, um, just just around the, the level of government investment we're seeing in regional New South Wales, and um, do we do we think there's the the joined up strategy around how we drive the growth of our regions, and I think some real opportunities coming out of COVID. Are, are we doing well enough to to join up the the employment planning, the skills planning? Um, the investment in new sustainable industries. Yeah, look, I think it's um, I think it's more critical than ever that actually, you know, those those economic visions and those plans that have been put in place you now all really need to be revised because I think the way in which anyone does business today, you know, has certainly changed in the in the last six months, and I think it goes to show that you know with technology as well. Uh, people don't necessarily have to be living away from home, and I think COVID, you know, has some advantages showing that, you know, whether whether it's a public servant at the end of the day, or whether people have been travelling, you know, to the to the city to be able to undertake that work, they don't necessarily have to do that into the future. So I think, you know, our communities, um, you know, rely on us actually ensuring that those skills are going to be retained, those skills are going to be coming into our local areas. And it's a holistic approach at the end of the day because I think when you look at some of these, you know, skills shortages that we have in our community, it's also about reshaping the way in which uh, TAFE operates. It's about looking at uh, the skills and the courses that are provided through these uh, organisations as well. I mean, we've got a lot of, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, CLCs or uh, learning centres that have actually been set up as well. So they've been critical in actually uh, providing, uh, you know, skill training in those local areas. Um, but yeah, look, there are some real challenges because, you know, our communities have been doing it tough for the last number of years. And, you know, there have been people that have actually closed their business doors. There are people that have been moved away, um, you know, but we also need to make sure that we continue to uh, support those communities that are reliant uh, on those on, on the activities that they undertake. So yeah, look, it, it comes with its challenges, Pete. It's a good question, but I think importantly, um, ensuring that the bush is going to have uh, that growth and ensuring that you know regions are continually seeing that investment by government is actually critical to ensuring that they are going to thrive into the future. Well, thanks very much for joining us tonight, Acting Deputy Premier. Um, good luck in uh, over the next few weeks. Um, and uh, as we move into, into the next decade, I think it has been great to see record levels of infrastructure investment, including a lot of that going to, to key projects out there in regional New South Wales. And uh, that'll set us up well to uh, to deliver on our growth ambition for agriculture in the, in the decade ahead. So many thanks for joining us and uh, good luck with the koalas next week. Yeah, my pleasure. Don't give me too many more headaches for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, I might just no, double check you. to make sure uh, Minister Mark is on the line. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. I'm here, Pete. Have yes. you joined us? Yep, I'm here. Good evening. How are you? Yeah, Thanks rough for enough. Joining us. <laughs> no dramas. Good, good to hear. Well, I might, um, yeah, hand over to, to you, Adam, as Minister for Agriculture and Minister for Western New South Wales to maybe uh, share some opening remarks on the decade ahead for farming and uh, agriculture in New South Wales. Yeah, thanks, Pete. I don't want to actually say too much. I'm more keen to address the questions just because I know you've uh, you've um, been talked to a lot this evening by um, uh, Mel and Tooley um, about important stuff, but um, I'll be very keen to get to questions, I guess, um, just very quickly from uh, the last few weeks, a uh, few months really has uh, uh, been all about, um, uh, you know, uh, COVID borders, ag permits, uh, National Agricultural Workers Code, uh, seasonal workers, quarantining, and of course, uh, the uh, the uh, lock up your land SEP, um, better known as the koala SEP. So that, that's, uh, 
Yeah, that's been my world lately, and I must say I've really appreciated, um, you know, the uh, the partnership and the work with you, Pete uh, and James, and and all of your staff at the the association. But look, um, from my perspective, um, I reckon it's a good time to be in agriculture. The future's certainly looking a hell of a lot better than it has any time in the last three three and a half years. Uh, despite uh, still some some pressures, particularly around workforce and some international markets, but nevertheless, um, conditions there's absolutely no doubt conditions have and continue to turn around, and uh, and uh, that pr presents uh, the the most optimistic lookout uh, as I've uh, gone around the state that that I've seen certainly in my time as minister and uh, and my time as a, as a local member in the state parliament. So. Um, I guess a uh, few uh, biggies um, recently um, taking off where Thule finished off um, the, the wild dog fence extension, which was a major project uh, election commitment that has formally commenced. That's that um, uh, 742 kilometre extension of the wild dog fence along the Queensland, New South Wales and New South Wales South Australian border. Uh, the uh, that's a 37 and a half million dollar project, and then we've got the Doppler weather radars, um, the the three new the new Doppler weather radars uh, that uh, that the state government's constructing based on an election commitment in the Western Division, um, and the first one of those is being built at Brewarrina, and that has almost finished and is ready for commissioning. The next one at Hilston, and the third one will be built around the the parks. Uh, Forbes area, uh, a site yet to be determined, um, uh, and th th those those uh, those two projects alone are going to be crucial for two very different regions for the um, future of agriculture, not just in the Western Division but right throughout the state. Um, in and uh, and that flows into a whole lot of other initiatives. But I might pull it up there, Pete, uh, and we can hook straight into the questions. Or if we've got a bit of time left over, I can uh, fill up the time with a bit of verbiage if you like. But well, I'm keen to get into the questions. Yeah, thanks, Minister. Well, we might start off. I mean, obviously, this goal of 30 billion by 2030 is a, a bit of a step up from our state's best, which was. 15.44 in 16-17. So we've effectively got to double our, our best effort. I mean, what, what do you see as critical around sort of creating the, the investment environment that agriculture will need to really see the, the, the investment in technology and in, in intensification in potentially more value adding and, and, and manufacturing? I mean, what, what do you see as the, the key things we need to get right to yeah. To, to realise that goal. Um, well, it, it is it is a goal, uh, and it's an aspiration. And aspirations are important, uh, not not for the sake of judging success or failure if we reach them, but driving uh, driving that that additional productivity and and really putting a stake in the ground and saying you know agriculture is crucial, and we're determined as a state to grow it, not only for our own economic benefit, but obviously to meet a, a growing um, uh, you know, f food task around the world. I guess the the critical things for me are, are, are pretty simple. Firstly, um, you know, it, it's about uh, protecting protecting agricultural land and agricultural interests from uh, interference from whether that's urban in urban sprawl, uh, urban encroachment, whether that's uh, other conflicting industries. Um, and that sounds easy in, in practice. I mean, we passed the right to farm legislation. Uh, I've appointed the uh, state's first ever agriculture commissioner, Daryl Quinn Liven, who is at the moment reviewing the government's right to farm policy. And I know Pete and you've been involved, so is James and others in those discussions about how we actually ring fence or protect our, our most productive agricultural land from ever being uh, used for anything other than agricultural production. That's crucial from my perspective, but then you've got to balance that against every farmer having a right, once they own their property, to run their business the way they want to run their business. Uh, and how do you tell a farmer uh, that they can't carpet their property with solar panels uh, if they're going to make, if they're going to run a better business out of doing that than continuing to graze sheep or cattle? So it, that is a nuanced area, but but the principle is. Um, we've got to protect the agricultural land that we've got. Secondly, we've got to continue our 
record investment in research and development. That's part of the reason why we're spending $50 million at the moment upgrading all of our research stations. And if the Treasurer is nice to me later this year, hopefully we'll be spending even more money um, doing more of that work across our research stations and increasing our research portfolio, not just in terms of um, uh, productive benefit for for various agricultural sectors, which DPI has traditionally done a very good job of partnering with industry to to research extra productivity grains, new strains of of crops, or or new ways of animal husbandry to get that that extra bit of you know conversion ratio to to get a a, a better better product. Um, uh, it's also about research in. Um, better biosecurity, better biological controls for, for pests, for weeds, uh, more research in how we can actually spend the public dollars better to look at feral deer, dogs, pigs, all of those major threats. So big part of what I see is not just driving extra productivity, Pete, but actually uh, as a government helping remove some of those barriers like wild dogs, which cost the ag sector, uh, you know, conservatively $24 million a year in productivity. Feral pigs, deer, um, and other um, nasty, uh, you know, uh, weeds like Hudson pear, things like that, where if we can come up with better ways of controlling them, knocking them down, or biological controls from some of those weeds, or just simply step up our weed eradication programs, that in and of itself will, I guess, remove some of the shackles off the sector to continue to, to grow and innovate and, and be more productive and remove a lot of the cost off, off farmers. The investment in the Doppler weather radars is crucial because it's about providing better information so that farmers can make better on-farm decisions. Um, and interestingly, that's an investment the federal government should be making, but won't. So the state government have stepped up to make that capital investment, and then we'll hand those radar stations over to the Commonwealth, and they've agreed to operate it. Um, and also, I could keep going on, but the other part of it is making sure we've got young people coming back into agriculture. And uh, one thing I, when I came into this portfolio I wanted to do was to drive a, a youth in agriculture strategy. And that's being developed at the moment because um, uh, if, ag if we're going to get to that goal, Pete, we've got to have uh, we've got to have young people coming back into agriculture or staying on the farm, staying on the land. Uh, and uh, and that's, that's a, a crucial uh, component of that as well. Question picks up on a number of those themes from uh, Oscar from Moree, who uh, you may have come across in your travels. Um, ne given the never, heard of, never heard of Oscar the farmer. Could be a pseudonym. <laughs> How will the New South Wales <laughs> government help farmers understand and, and manage climate risks? And there's, there's been quite a few questions coming through on this question of climate risk, adaptation, change. How do we move forward for farming? Um, well, I think. We recognise, I mean, I, I hate this binary argument in politics. I mean, there's one at the moment going on and has been for a decade on on renewables versus coal or, or energy mix. And the other one is is you're either a climate denier, uh, uh, which means you're a right-wing extremist, or you're uh, a climate change believer, which means you're a, a raging lefty. Um, I mean, climate change is absolutely real. Uh, anyone in agriculture knows that it is um, because the, the, the fact speaks for themselves and, and we've adapted uh, to continue uh, farming, Alan, and we've adapted our practices to, uh, to meet the, the changing climate. And that's part of the reason why we're, uh, as a government, investing you know, nearly $30 million. I think it's a bit over t about 29 and a half, something like that million dollars in the primary industry's climate change research strategy that we've got going because it's, it's targeted at uh, basically addressing those climate and energy challenges faced by farmers. So that um, we've got, uh, and from memory, the strategy covers around six or seven areas like uh, energy, carbon farming opportunities, climate resilience, um, and um, a few other areas which I can't remember off the top of my head, Pete. Uh, but essentially, there are a number of uh, smaller projects within that research portfolio. And like everything that the Department of Primary Industries on behalf of the government does in terms of research, all of that information is uh, is released publicly and made available to farmers. And then uh, what I'm interested in doing though, uh, as the Ag Minister, and, and, and it's something that's gonna take some time is to 
is to create a much stronger link between the research side around climate resilience, regen ag, and all the good stuff that DPI researchers do and have a world reputation for doing. But then how do we convert that into changes in on-farm practice or make it available at a, at a level where farmers can easily pick it up, absorb it, and implement it on farm. And I think that's where local land services uh, is, is the body that's ideal, uh, New South Wales farmers included, but LLS's whole purpose is extension, people actually going out on farm. And I think there's been a bit of a disconnect in the past between DPIs doing its research stuff, which they do a great job, but they're not the key to good research is making sure that it's available, uh, people are able to digest it and implement it. And I think that's where LLS can play a role in taking that research and then rebadging it or, or couching it in a way that can be uh, actually used by farmers on farm and actually helping them with some of those extension projects. So um, it's not just in the climate resilience area, it's in a lot of DPI's research where um, I think there's a bit of a gap between the good research and actually on farm implementation. And I think that's where we can do a lot better job. And I think local land services can, can help fill that gap between the research and the farmer, and they can be the middle person conveying that and making sure the good research actually um, Actually, the result of that is 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 changing practice over time on farm. Adam, we've had a few questions. I guess out of the thirty billion goal, it doesn't necessarily need to be generated from the products we've always produced on farms. I guess there are some new potential revenue streams that that may be available to farmers currently and certainly over the next decade. And we've had a few few questions around the the role of, of farmers in delivering biodiversity and natural capital outcomes for, for the wider community. There's obviously the, the generation opportunities that, that, that will exist and will continue to expand on farm and, and potentially agritourism as everyone's looking to holiday at home, some, some great opportunities mm. for farm mm. states and, and so on. I'm just interested in your, your comments around how we can, can encourage uh, those those opportunities, and I, I guess ensure we 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 build that community buy, and that that, that really is so key to uh, to ensuring that that these new revenue opportunities can can coexist with with, with prime agriculture in, in New South Wales. Yeah, um, there's two really critical elements I think to that to your series of questions there, Pete. One is that one, it's about diversification, and and I hate using the term drought proofing, but essentially, if we allow farmers to basically diversify their operations if they wish to, um, then we, we're spreading that risk, no matter what the the climate or the markets throw at us. Secondly, um, if we're able to monetize or, or commercialize um, the the biodiversity both above and below ground on farm, not only does it diversify and provide an economic outcome, it actually helps present a very strong argument for our industry's critics. You know, I, I get absolutely pummeled um, in, the, in the parliament and in the court of public opinion by a lot of um, uh, other interest groups and MPs that obviously uh, are not uh, so favoured towards agriculture because they have the perception that agriculture is all about if it moves, kill it, uh, and if it's standing, chop it down. And that's obviously not what agriculture is about. But but we we fail to really prosecute that argument strongly. So I am very keen to to, to in this actual policy area. In fact, I've I've had discussions with Minister Littleproud on a number of occasions about how we as a state can work very closely with the Commonwealth in, in relation to their, for example, their Commonwealth, you know, their agricultural stewardship program around biodiversity policy, biodiversity stewardship, and the biodiversity certification scheme uh, about carbon sequestration as well, uh, and about how we can come up with a method of actually commercializing that, quantify, measuring, quantifying, commercializing it. Um, and, and a whole host of things. So um, I don't have anything concrete to present to you right now, Pete, but rest assured to you and everyone else, uh, we are, as a state, considering new methods to measure, monitor and report the biodiversity benefits uh, farm on farms and working with the Commonwealth to try and come up with some and support, be very supportive of ways that we can monetize, commercialize, whatever you want to call it, to not only diversify 
uh, farming operations present a, a new income stream, but also I think uh, publicly to really try and correct that that myth that um, that somehow all of us out here in the bush are just all environmental vandals because when you have that perception is allowed to ferment that's when you get very very adverse and very poor policy decisions and legislative outcomes through our parliaments well i think we've all learned quite a bit about the new south wales planning system over the last couple of months with the the, the tree sep and some of rob stokes's proposals there and obviously a key piece of work from Daryl Quinn Livin coming into the role as, as Ag Commissioner. I mean, how do you sort of see that that regional planning framework shaping up, Adam, to to once again create that environment to to, to give investment certainty and confidence? Yeah, well, for me, this is crucial. The the right to farm bill and legislation that went through the Parliament uh, it was never meant to be the silver bullet. It's just the it's just the first step. The next is is our right to farm policy uh, and looking at delving into the very very complicated area of, uh, of 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 the planning system and how we essentially protect uh, the productive agricultural land that we have from being converted from that into uh, residential housing developments or or being converted to to other uses because at a at a macro strategic level across New South Wales and across Australia. I know it's a very it's a very blunt statement and a very simple one, but the reality is the the, agri the 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 productive agricultural land that we have is all we have. We can't create more. We can sure we can drive extra productivity and getting better yields uh, out of less inputs for sure. And the market will always drive us and people in agriculture to do that anyway. But but gradually over time, if we continue to see the chipping away, the chipping away of productive agricultural land, it gets to a point where, where you can't carve any more fat or meat off the bone. You're literally carving into the bone. Uh, and, and we're not going to go anywhere near getting to our $30 billion target if, if we allow that to happen. So Daryl's primary role that I've, I've challenged him uh, to deal with first up uh, is that issue to work with the Department of Planning, to work with the uh, New South Wales farmers, to work with various uh, industry groups and particularly local government, which is the critical player that often never gets a seat at the table when these things are issued. But who controls the LEPs? Who makes 70% of the planning decisions in our New South Wales planning system? It's your local council. Uh, and that's where often the flashpoint is, but the least amount of engagement and understanding is. So look, this is not going to be easy. It's going to be difficult and it's going to be complicated, but I'm committed uh, while ever I sit in this chair to to drive that agenda. And uh, and as we've seen with the recent discussions around the koala set that obviously, and I really again appreciate Pete, you and James and, and all the team that have been involved in those, it is it is detail focused. It is nuanced, and it is a clash of a clash of different views sometimes about how the world should work. Um, and uh, and it's it's going to be a very difficult needle to thread. But it's crucial to ensure that you know in 50 years time, um, agriculture is not only still strong, but it's bigger than what it is now. And uh, it's still providing employment and um, uh, for Australians. And importantly, we're doing our our part to meet that food task in the world. And we can't do it if if agricultural land is continually bit by bit chipped away. Uh, and so, at some point, we have to make that stand. The longer we leave it, the the more drastic action we have to take. So, um, um, and uh, that's that's why the government committed to an ag commissioner. It's why he's been appointed, and why the type of person that's been appointed has been appointed to really drive drive this this forward. I think horticulture is a, a real opportunity, Adam, to to grow the value of our sector here in, in New South Wales. Yep. I was reading something this morning that there'll be direct flights reaching about three and a half billion people out of the Western Sydney airport. So when those export opportunities are, are amazing. Got a question from our um, our Hort Chair, Guy Gayata from uh, from Orange. 
I'd be interested in your comments on the horticultural opportunity, but I mean, how do we deal with some of those those real challenges the industry's facing around things like like flying foxes and uh, and, and netting and, and so on that you know once again are, are sapping the, the the value of our our current crops, let alone any future potential. Mm. Well, I'll have some really good news to announce very shortly about netting, uh, but I won't go into much more detail on that on this call, but there will be some good news in that space. And Guy knows what I'm talking about because I had a conversation with him uh, a few weeks ago when I was uh, in Orange. Um, but um, And that'll be I'll be making that announcement very shortly. Um, the other, well, what COVID showed us, particularly in the hort industry, is, is workforce uh, can, can be problematic. And um, it just COVID shown us how much we really do rely on the, the seasonal workforce in agriculture, not just in horticulture, but right across agriculture. So workforce uh, is, is definitely an issue. Uh, and, and we've got a lot of work to do to, I guess, um, improve in some areas of the state how the horticultural industry is viewed. Um, I, I've been... Um, I've been on that that Coffs coast all the way up the north coast on a number of occasions, and the uh, what strikes me, and I'll be quite frank here, as someone who spent their whole life living west of the Great Dividing Range, I I I must admit I was sat on my bum uh, listening to the councils and a number of community members and or, and groups just the way that they badmouth the the horticultural industries up and down the coast it was quite extraordinary because i just couldn't believe that people would have that view for an industry that is such a huge employer and injects so much money into the local economy and is such a good industry and in terms of um uh you know impact uh, on neighbors impact on the region it's such a good industry um, so we've also got a, little, a fair bit of work to do, I think, in some areas of the state, Pete, to really change that perception, change that conversation. I don't have an answer to how we do that at the moment, but it's something I'm certainly turned my mind to because like, like other industries, uh, I'm thinking extractive industries, um, it's very difficult to see an industry continue to grow and expand if we don't have... Uh, the the general support of the community for that industry to exist. So we can carp on about we've got a right to be here and a right to farm, and we do. But but if you uh, if we don't um, sell that message and do the good work in the community to, so that the community has a positive view of that industry, it's going to get harder and harder. Not forget about expanding. It's just going to get harder and harder to keep that industry in those areas. So, yeah, I think the, the netting, the workforce, and the, the community attitude, which then flows into local government, um, local government's attitude, and therefore planning decisions, that they're all crucial areas of of making sure we can continue to see the, the hort sector grow. Adam, you've touched on on young farmers um, in a number of your remarks, and, and obviously over the next decade, you know, we we are likely to see a, a fairly large generational change in, in agriculture. I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts on what the government's doing to to support uh, young people to to get a start in in, in farming. Um, stamp duty remains a, a significant barrier, and I guess any other work that you, you're driving. Uh, and a shout out to Bronnie Taylor, the, the Minister for Regional Youth, who's who's very uh, in, engaged around these questions as well. I mean, what's the plan to, to get that next generation uh, engaged and uh, and starting in agriculture in the decade ahead? Yeah, it's an important one for me. Um, I'm not as young as I used to be. I guess none of us are. But, you know, if the, the future of, of agriculture is always dependent on there always being farmers. And... Uh, so we need to continually see young people stay in the industry and come in. And um, you know, the the government's Young Farmer Business Program, uh, which is a very successful program, in 2016, their their survey found the top three barriers to entry for young people in ag were finance, access to land, and succession planning. So we've done a fair bit of work as a government to rejig the Farm Innovation Fund uh, to uh, provide that that low interest. Um, finance even for new entrants that have never been in agriculture so they can also access that and asking the Commonwealth to follow suit which they have through the Regional Investment Corporation's Agri-Starter loans 
Um, so that's crucial. The stamp duties is a is one that I think sticks out, um, and I acknowledge that it does present a barrier. That's why I've uh, I've met with the treasurer. I've written to the treasurer formally, seeking consideration of the issue and and flagging a uh, a first farm buyer scheme, if you like, first home buyer scheme with stamp duty waivers, uh, doing the same in an agricultural setting. So uh, I've uh, firmly put that on the treasurer's agenda to, again, just remove one of those barriers uh, that, that exist. It, it might not be the deciding factor, it might help everyone, but it's just about removing uh, one, of those, uh, one of those barriers. And as I said, Overlaying all of that is the development of our youth in agriculture strategy, which we're developing now, and I hope to um, to have that finalised and released either late this year or early next year, which again will touch on a number of those key barriers and 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 really um, tying the government to focusing on that area and delivering on a number of those issues to essentially remove those barriers. I mean, we can't force young people into agriculture, but we can, as a government, try and remove those barriers. And uh, and the industry will sell itself. Maybe just a final question around around drought, uh, Minister. And I know the New South Wales government has invested with the National Farmers Federation in a really key project around financial risk management opportunities um, that are currently available or may be available over the over the next decade. I'm, I'm just interested in your your reflections on. The drought we've lived through, and, um, and what's the possibility of, of some of those risk management um, products or, or options really, really emerging as, as as real options for farmers in the next decade ahead? Yeah, well, look, there's we're we're just about to kick off a review. I think um, I know the drought is not over, but I've I've uh, asked DPI to involve an external body and conduct a review of all our drought assistance programs. Um, one, I want to I, I want to ensure that what what I think and uh, is is correct about the programs, about what worked well, what didn't, but also obviously make a very strong case to Treasury that these sort of measures that we implemented during drought were worth investing in, like the drought transport subsidy. I don't need to rattle them off, you all know <clears throat> what they all are. Um, the Farm Innovation Fund obviously will be is a permanent fund and it will always be there um, in drought, out of drought. Um, but the the project you're talking about for me is an absolute uh, crucial one, and that's the um, that's the, the essentially whatever you want to call it, um, but essentially the the far, the, uh, the farm uh, uh, the uh, the farm income insurance scheme. So essentially uh, like multi-peril insurance in the cropping sector, but something, uh, a, a scheme, a nationwide scheme that is available to everyone in agriculture, whether you're a cropper, a grazier, uh, an apiarist, a horticulturalist, um, what, uh, in aquaculture, whatever you are, whatever your size, you can you can buy in and, 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 and be a policy holder. Um, we need to give farmers more tools to be able to manage um, more of the ups and downs themselves. Um, we cannot, as an industry, just simply always look to government to to support the industry uh, to the hilt in in every time there's a drought. We're going to have more droughts, uh, hopefully not as severe as the one that we've just had. But you just don't know who's going to be in government next time, and you don't know if they'll even have any money, even if they want to help, whether they'll have the $4 billion that we've shelled out during the drought for drought measures just in New South Wales alone. That's a significant amount of money, and I don't you know, apologise to anyone for that amount of money. I think it's money well spent to support an industry worth nearly $16 billion a year to the state, absolutely. But um, but that's a lot of money. You don't know whether the next government or whoever is going to be uh, on these phone calls will actually have access to that amount of money. So we need... Uh, to to give farmers more options, more tools in their kit bag, if you like. Now, a lot of people think I'm mad for pursuing this because they say it doesn't work. Otherwise, multi-peril crop insurance would be everywhere instead of the products being here one year, away the next. There are a lot of experts that I've talked to, both in Australia and internationally, that say it will work. But that's why the state government, we've put $2 million on the table to partner with New South Wales Farmers, NFF, to get the best experts in the business and really scope this out to see if it will work. And if it will work, then 
let's see if governments, uh, New South Wales included, will potentially stay the scheme in the first two years, first few years, while they get enough policyholders to make the scheme stand on its own two feet from right across Australia. Obviously, price, the, the coverage has got to be ideal, the risk profile's got to be able to be quantified, but also the policy, uh, the policies have to be at a price point where they're affordable, where we'll have buy-in. And maybe it's got to be, you know, somehow made, um, you know, not just it's an option, but farmers have to buy in. And maybe there's a like a private health insurance scheme. Maybe there's a, a tax break that provides an incentive for farmers to actually take out a policy because there'll be some financial benefits. I don't know, Pete, but essentially, um, that's that to me is an important tool. Uh, if it is possible, we need to do it. Uh, if it's not, well, then I don't believe the effort and the money spent in investigating it thoroughly will be wasted because we've got to be able to answer that question because um, I get just as many people telling me it won't work as people saying it will work, it's worked in other countries, we should do it here and we need it here. We need farmers to stand on their own two feet more and don't be reliant on government so much. Government will always be there, but my point is that if you can, if you can take out those peaks and troughs uh, and get a bit more certainty and consistency, that will, will uh, not only help on-farm business, but help people's confidence in investing in agriculture as well. Well, thank you, Minister. Thanks for your uh, your time this evening and for being so generous in, in offering your thoughts across such a, a wide range of, of critical topics for our, our sector. I think we've really valued the, the energy and the, the fresh perspectives you've brought, brought to the portfolio and uh, well, both parts of your portfolio, both agriculture and importantly, Western New South Wales that uh, has seen a bit of rain over recent weeks, which is mm. is great to see. So, uh, yeah, on behalf of New South Wales farmers, uh, thanks, Minister, and I might throw over to uh, to James Jackson, our president, just to uh, offer some um, some reflections and some closing remarks. Thanks, James. And thank you very much, uh, Pete, and thank you, uh, Adam, for your contribution tonight. That was very interesting. I know. Um, you know, politics uh, for you has been very reactive uh, lately by the very nature of uh, the yeah. challenges that have been put in front of uh, government and, um, you know, with the labour issues, um, you know, with that, uh, the border issues, um, you know, with the bushfires, with, um, with the drought, very reactive. And it's very good that uh, you've had an opportunity to, do, you know, delve into that vision piece, which is uh, quite important. And uh, it shows that you, uh, you are thinking, you're engaged on it, and uh, we certainly welcome your comments. Um, and I, I was instructed to give a bit of a shout out for our, uh, our productivity document. We've got a, a, a document, um, uh, you know, uh, looking at uh, the COVID recovery plan, which is essentially a productivity plan. And it's actually amazing, uh, the three ministers, how much of that uh, productivity plan they covered uh, this evening. You know, yourself, uh, being an old scientist, um, you know, it's, it, it warms my heart when somebody gets excited about uh, research. Um, <laughs> you know, I, th I, th I think it is actually quite important. It's a quite important piece for that uh, productivity uh, into the future. And I, I'm heartened to hear that you're, um, you're, um, you're engaged in that process. Uh, as I was with uh, Minister Tool with the infrastructure spend, that logistics uh, project uh, is absolutely critical uh, to getting our uh, our product to the market, and certainly a critical piece of the um, uh, productivity agenda going forward is getting this water equation right. And uh, Minister Pavey has got that um, uh, inner sights. So uh, look, I think. On behalf of New South Wales farmers, I'd like to uh, thank all three of the ministers for their time tonight uh, and your insight into uh, where you see agriculture uh, heading in this state towards our target of 30 million by 2030. So thank you very much. And thanks for people attending. It's, uh, it's been a good interactive process. Thanks, James. Thank you, James. So thank you to everyone for, for joining the webinar tonight. Um, as I mentioned, this will be the first of a number of webinars we'll be looking to, to hold around the 30 by 30 theme over the months ahead. Uh, New South Wales Farmers is uh, fiercely apolitical, so we look forward to hearing some perspectives from people on the other side of the chambers and uh, 
and maybe even the crossbench. Uh, it, it's great, the interest in our sector that we're seeing at the moment and uh, with a bit of rain about that the future is looking, uh, looking brighter than ever. So thanks again for joining us and we look forward to you uh, joining a webinar in the near future. Thanks again, have a great night.